Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Ma Padmapani Padan here, and uh, Dr. Ya myself and Dr. Yasas uh, Kolamge, we are going to co-host uh, the September webinar. So first of all, uh, it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you all for the September webinar organized by the Human Genetic Society. And uh, before I introduce uh, today's speaker, I would like to uh, remind you all a few housekeeping messages. Uh, and uh, please make sure to mute your microphones and um, uh, switch off the video cameras. And also, if you have any questions, please raise your questions at the end of uh, session. Uh, we will be providing a separate Q&A session, uh, which will be at the end of the presentation. So now, uh, let me introduce today's speaker. Um, it's an absolute uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Sachit Metananda, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, for the today's webinar. And I have known him for a long time since our undergraduate days. And Professor Mettananda is going to speak about uh, genome editing of human alpha globin enhancer as a cure for beta thalassemia. And uh, Professor Sachit Mettananda graduated MBBS uh, with first class honors from uh, University of Colombo and obtained his MD in pediatrics and board certification as a specialist in pediatrics from the Postgraduate Institute, University of Colombo. And he obtained a DPhil uh, in clinical laboratory sciences from the Wetherall Institute of Molecular Medicine, University of Oxford, by studying the manipulation of human globin genes using genome editing to devise a cure for beta thalassemia. He has over 60 scientific publications, which include first of the publications in Nature Communications, Blood, Scientific Reports, Hematologica, Annals of New York Academy of Science, Hematology Oncology Clinics of North America, and Experimental Hematology. He has won a lot of awards, including presidential awards for scientific publications and Commonwealth Scholarship Awards, and has delivered the prestigious SLM oration and the Professor C. C. De Silva oration. Currently, he is a professor and the head in the Department of Pediatrics of the uh, University of Calonia and a consultant pediatrician at the Kalampu North Teaching Hospital, Braga. It's my pleasure to invite Professor Mettananda to deliver his speech. Over to you, Professor Mettananda. Thank you. Thank you, Pani. <clears throat> First of all, I must thank the President and the Council of the Human Genetic Society of Sri Lanka to inviting me to share some of my work, which I'm still continuing, uh, on novel genome editing approach to device a cure for patients with thalassemia. So thank you once again for the Human Genetics Society of Sri Lanka. And it's indeed a pleasure to talk to an interested audience, interested local audience regarding uh, some preliminary work that we have done on the gene on genome editing with regards to beta thalassemia. Okay, so let's move on. As we all know, genetic basis of for human diseases are increasingly being recognized. And most of these are monogenic disorders, which were recognized quite early, early days. But nowadays, people are, are characterizing various complex inheritance patterns, which include epigenetic patterns that contribute to disease causation. When it comes to genetic diseases, monogenic diseases, it has been a challenge to devise a cure or a treatment for these disorders because the inherent nature of genetics in human body. To find a cure for these genetic diseases, people were trying manipulation of human genome. People were trying manipulation of human genome since early 1990s. The uh, gene therapy approaches showed initial promise, especially in the treatment of severe combined immune deficiency disorders in early 90s. And in fact, 
went into clinical trials. However, with the results of certain trials, it was evident that gene therapy is not that straightforward. There were inherent immune toxicities of the procedure, as well as uh, several children or several patients who underwent gene therapy developed leukemias due to activation of oncogenes. When it, when it comes to traditional gene therapy, we are inserting a normal gene using viral vectors, which can get inserted in any location in the genome. When it is inserted close to an oncogene, the expression levels of those genes changes and that has shown to produce some malignant potential and causes of causing leukemias. So due to these major drawbacks, the gene therapy progress of the development of gene therapy was retarded. However, with the advent of extremely novel genome editing technologies in the last decade, during the last decade, the genetic based, genetic based therapies are now starting to show promise as a cure for monogenic disorders. So in the next few minutes, maybe in the next 30 minutes or so, what I would, what I try to do is to take thalassemia as an example and to show how these genome editing genetic based therapies can be utilized to devise a cure for monogenic disorders. We will be talking why genetic therapies are necessary for thalassemia, what genomic targets are there to target for gene therapy, how to select the best genetic targets to perform genome editing and the genomic location, how to, to perform genome editing and how exactly the genome editing techniques are being done, the methodology part of it, and to present some early in vitro and in vivo data of the work that we have been we have uh, done for the last five years, as well as to show you the challenges that people who are involved in genome therapy, ge genome editing and gene therapy are facing. Being medical genetists, we all know beta thalassemia is one of the most common genetic disorders in the world. It is estimated approximately 70,000 children are born with thalassemia, beta thalassemia every year. This, most of these births occur in the traditional thalassemia bed, which is colored in green, which extends from the Mediterranean to South and Southeast Asia. Beta thalassemia is one of the very common genetic diseases in Sri Lanka as well. We believe there are 60 children with severe forms of thalassemia born annually in Sri Lanka and currently we have approximately 1,800 patients being cared in 26 different centers across Sri Lanka, majority being treated at Kurunagala, Anuradhapura and Ragama thalassemia centers. Thalassemia is a life-limiting disease. Patients will present during late infancy the second half of infancy with severe anemia due to problem of globin synthesis. The presentation is with palo, growth failure, hepatosplenomegaly and bony changes. To counteract anemia, they require two to five weekly blood transfusions and that is for life. With blood transfusions, iron is infused into the body and the human body does not have a mechanism to excrete iron. Therefore, this iron will get accumulated and cause problems and organ dysfunction leading to poor quality of life and premature death. The average life expectancy of children with thalassemia or patients with thalassemia in Sri Lanka is approximately 20 to 30 years. So the oldest patient with thalassemia I know has not lived beyond 50 years. So it's a life limiting disease, but majority die in, in teens and early 20s. There is a cure for thalassemia at present, which is allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. 
is available in Sri Lanka, only in the private sector at the moment. However, even if you have money, there are several limitations that limits the availability of this for all patients, even in developed countries. For example, UK or USA, still a large proportion of patients with thalassemia are managed with supportive treatment because not availability of curative therapies. Although bone marrow transplantation is available, most patients lack suitable donors. The best results have been obtained from transplanting bone marrows of siblings of patients with thalassemia. As you all know, patients with thalassemia will generally not have siblings because of the sort of counseling that they undergo. And even if they are, some siblings might have thalassemia. Apart from the lack of availability of donors, transplant is a serious procedure that has a mortality risk of approximately 5 to 10 percent and the graft rejection are common complications following bone marrow transplantation. Due to this, most approximately 90 percent of patients with thalassemia in the world do not have an available cure. Therefore, we need some new alternative effective treatment therapy treatment options to cure thalassemia. So whatever the cure has to come through genetic based therapies. To find out or to understand how genetic based therapies can be applied to thalassemia, we need to see the pathophysiology or molecular pathology of thalassemia. In brief, what happens in beta thalassemia is due to point mutations, mostly point mutations in the beta globin gene, the expression of beta globin is reduced or absent, and beta globin is an essential component of adult hemoglobin, which is hemoglobin A. So in homozygous states, beta two beta globin genes will not or produce very small amounts of beta globin. However, the production of alpha globin continues normally and this excess alpha globin precipitates in red cells as free alpha globin to cause red cell destruction. The excess alpha globin is the primary, primary culprit in producing hemolysis and ineffective erythropoiesis in patients with thalassemia. Some of the alpha globin can be combined with gamma globin, which is a suppressed gene after the fetal life. So it's a fetal form of beta, fetal type of beta globin, which is suppressed. But in patients with thalassemia, it is expressed at a lower rate, lower rate. So some will combine with alpha globin to produce hemoglobin F. But the rate of synthesis of gamma globin is not equal to alpha globin. So there will be an excess of free alpha globin, which will precipitate in erythroid cells and their precursors to cause anemia. If we look at this pathophysiology or molecular basis, there will be three places that we can identify, that we identify as potential targets to devise a cure. The best would be to correct an abnormal beta globin, which is, which is being tried using traditional gene therapy approaches. However, the success rates have, been, have not been so great. With the novel genome editing techniques that we are, I'm going to discuss in the next few minutes, several labs around the world are trying two different approaches. Most labs, especially the uh, Harvard University in USA, they have a, a sophisticated genome editing facility, are trying to find ways to de-repress the gamma globin or to improve the production of gamma globin and to reduce the alpha globin excess, thus causing improvement in patients with beta thalassemia. So these genome editing approaches are trying to induce gamma globin. Whereas the lab I worked in UK probably is the only lab that tried an approach different to this, that is to directly reduce the production of alpha globin, because we know that the alpha globin is excess amount of alpha globin is the main reason for hemolysis and ineffective erythropoiesis in patients with thalassemia. 
So the approach we took was to utilize genome editing to reduce the alpha globin production. So this base, this, this hypothesis is not only based on molecular pathological data, but were also based on clinical data using natural mutations. As we reviewed in this paper published in blood, we reviewed several publications where there have been patients who inherit alpha thalassemia mutation. That means they have a in, uh, intrinsic reduction in alpha globin production they with the beta thalassemia mutation. So patients who co-inherit beta thalassemia with deletion of alpha globin genes have a less severe phenotype and they were doing much better with the older age at presentation, smaller splenic and hepatic sizes, less severe anemia and reduced transfusion requirement. For example, if we take these two kids, they do have identical beta globin mutation, HBE beta, HBE beta thalassemia, both children, same identical mutation. However, their phenotype was markedly different. The child to your left has a very severe phenotype, presents early in the life, sort of in infancy, massive hepatosplenomegaly and is transfusion dependent for life. Whereas the child to the right has very mild phenotype, just palpable spleen, never required a transfusion. The reason for less severe phenotype in the girl is that she also co-inherits an alpha thalassemia mutation. So when the beta thalassemia mutation is is associated with an alpha thalassemia mutation that will reduce the excess of alpha globin in the red cells and cause reduction of milder phenotype. So in this review, we, we found that if we can reduce the alpha globin levels by about 25 to 50 percent in patients with beta thalassemia, we should be able to ameliorate the disease and in fact maybe we will, we will achieve a stage where blood transfusions are not required. However, I must emphasize, we, we should not be aiming at a reduction of 100% because alpha globin is, is essential to produce whatever the hemoglobin, hemoglobin FO, hemoglobin E2. So the, there has to be a titrated reduction in alpha globin if we are to use this as a therapeutic approach. Right, so now we are clear that if we can reduce the amount of alpha globin in erythroid cells in patients with beta thalassemia, we should be able to ameliorate the disease that might lead to a possible cure. Then how to do this was the next question. So if we are to do this, we need to selectively reduce the production of alpha globin without affecting the production of beta or gamma globin in erythroid cells. One can argue that we might mutate the alpha globin and reduce the production of alpha globin, which is a reasonable argument. As you all know, we have alpha globin is a duplicated gene, so there are four copies of alpha globin. But if we can directly mutate the alpha globin, the alpha globin production will be completely abolished, most if, if we do it properly. So it will be quite hard to titrate the reduction in alpha globin. Remember, we need approximately 25 to 50% reduction in alpha globin output to in patients with beta thalassemia. Then we look at the regulation of alpha globin genes. And we all know the human genes or any, any gene is regulated through enhancers, transcription factors, and epigenetic mechanisms. If we can manipulate one of these, we should be able to find a way to titrate the reduction or sort of reduce the expression of alpha globin. That was the thinking process. Transcription factors are proteins bound to DNA segments, which are, which are difficult, they are difficult drug targets. So it's quite difficult for someone to target transcription factors that are involved in alpha globin expression. Epigenetics could be manipulated using epigenetic inhibitor drugs. I'm sure you know what epigenetic means. Those are the changes, methylation of DNA as well as histone protein changes. With the epigenetic inhibitor drugs, people were developing some, some genetic-based therapies. We have done some work, but I'm not going to present. What I'm going to focus today is 
our approach in mutating one of the alpha globin enhancers to find a way to reduce the expression of alpha globin in erythroid cells. So we, we thought the best way forward would be to genome edit one of the enhancers of alpha globin. To do that, we need to characterize the enhancers of alpha globin. That has been the work done in the lab that I worked in UK for the last 30 years. During the last 30 years, they have been working on alpha globin regulation and their work as well as other works by others have found that there are four important enhancers lying upstream to the alpha globin genes in human chromosome number 16. So there are four enhancers which are known as MCSR1 to R4 of which the previous uh, transgenic mice studies have shown MCSR2 enhancer which is a DNA segment of 258 base pair which has transcription factor binding sites for GATA1 and NFE2 which are important transcription factors in globin gene expression. The MCSR2 is the most critical enhancer, enhancing the expression of alpha globin. So we told, is probably the enhancer that we want to target. So they, the, this data came from molecular genetic studies. This was also confirmed by a clinical study which described a patient, the Portuguese patient, who has a complete deletion of this MCSR2 enhancer. He had his alpha globin genes normal, so in both chromosomes, all four sort of all four alpha globin genes were normal. There were no mutations in alpha globin genes. However, he has a homozygous deletion of the MCSR2 enhancer. And that has resulted in hemoglobin H disease, that is an intermediate form of alpha thalassemia in that patient. So this patient has presented with hypochromic mucositic anemia and the blood film was positive for hemoglobin H inclusion bodies and the alpha globin output was retarded to approximately 25% from the normal despite him having normal alpha globin genes. So that confirmed that his MCSR2 enhancer in vivo in humans is also the most critical enhancer that regulates the expression of alpha globin. So we were very sure if we can target this enhancer we should be able to down regulate the expression of alpha globin to a remarkable level that might benefit patients with beta thalassemia. So deletion of mutate, deletion or mutation of the a complete deletion of that segment, which is a 258 kilo base pair segment, or a mutation of this enhancer should reduce the alpha globin production in erythroid cells of patients with beta thalassemia. So that was our hypothesis at this stage. How to do that? Yes, we thought of doing it using genome editing. Genome editing is a, is a technique that makes a specific change at a targeted site of the human or whatever the genome. So you can, you can make a double strand break in DNA in a targeted site and exactly where you want. Using uh, several, there are three different techniques that's being used and in all three techniques what happens is using molecular sitters or endonucleases, a double strand break is made in the human genome and we can target it using different approaches. So this approach, genome editing approach is used to disrupt or mutate a gene or correct and rarely to replace a gene. The easy or the most efficient way is to disrupt a gene or a mutate a gene. Correction and replacement of a gene as you do it in standard gene therapy is, is still not optimal and it's quite difficult. So there are, we thought genome editing is the way forward and there are three major genome editing tools available at the moment. Mega nucleases have gone out of fashion and no one is probably using those but sync finger nucleases, talents, were the initial genome editing tools 
that were available in early 2000 or maybe in 2000 to 2010. However, in 2013, the CRISPR-Cas9 system, which is a very powerful tool of genome editing, was invented. And for the last probably seven or eight years, the genome editing is probably become straightforward, easy, and quite accurate using CRISPR-Cas9 system. So I'm not going to talk to you more about zinc finger nucleases and talons, which are still being used to a lesser level, but they are quite time consuming and difficult to, difficult to use. Whereas CRISPR-Cas9 is a very powerful tool, which is easy to manage, easy to produce and easy to use and has been in the use for the last seven to eight years. And we thought the best way to do this is using CRISPR-Cas9. So CRISPR-Cas9 is probably, probably the, one of the greatest recent inventions in medicine, right? So probably will be awarded the Nobel Prize in uh, any time. It's, it's so powerful tool to genome edit and, and it's quite easy and it's, it's widely available. How does this work, CRISPR-Cas9? So Cas9 is a protein endonuclease that makes double strand beings in a specific location, which is three base pairs upstream to us, this TAM sequence. TAM sequence is NGG sequence. So if you have a genomic location with NGG sequence, N can be any, any nucleotide, right? Any base, NGG sequence, it will cut the DNA, double, it will make a double strand break, three base pairs upstream to that TAM sequence. We direct Cas9 to the location that we need using a 20 nucleotide long RNA, single strand RNA. So that's called a guide RNA. Single guide RNA will guide the Cas9 to the specific location that we require the cut to be made. And the Cas9 will make the, as a molecular scissor and will make a double strand break. So we can, we can design guide RNAs to any location which is lying up sort of with the NGG sequence. N, NGG, right? N is, a, any nucle N is any nucleotide. So when a double strand break is made, you all know the DNA has intrinsic repair mechanisms. Two main mechanisms are non-homologous enjoining, which is the common mechanism, and homology-directed repair. Non-homologous non enjoining is an error-prone mechanism. So when it is repaired, some bases might insert, some may get deleted, and it will introduce a very short indel to the genome when it is being repaired. But that's the commonly happening mechanism with Cas9. So the common Mute, sort of a way to produce a mutation is using this non-homologous enjoining pathway. Whereas homology directed repair can be used to correct an abnormal gene or maybe to insert a gene, but that needs a, a homology arms that is a DNA sequence as well as, and it is it is not that efficient at the moment. So our thinking process. So we are going to cure thalassemia by reducing the alpha globin excess in erythroid cells by removing the most important alpha globin enhancer, which is MCSR2. So if you, as you see, so we need to make two cuts at the either end of the MCSR2 enhancer, right? Using two CRISPR molecules. And we assume, we, we predict that the Cut part will be removed, which is probably 250 base pairs, and then the two ends will join, and the genome will not have MCSR2 enhancer. If we could do that to patients, cells, hematopoietic stem cells of patients with thalassemia, then we should be able to cure thalassemia. So, how to translate this into clinical practice? As you can see in this picture, we can harvest hematopoietic stem cells, which are CD34 positive cells, from patients with beta thalassemia. We should be able to edit them in vitro. So you select the CD34s, 
and change the genome, remove the MCSR2 enhancer and transfuse them back. So that was the that was a long-term aim. Transplant them as a autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Because the cells are autologous, the children they will there won't be any graft versus host disease and there won't be any rejection. So it will work 100 percent if we can do this genome editing. So we, we designed several guide RNAs to the either side of the MCSR2 enhancer using this CRISPR-Cas9 technique. And these are the locations that we directed the guide RNAs. So either end, we have four guide RNAs designed to the proximal length and three to the distal length. And we, we insert these guide RNAs in pairs. One cutting at the proximal length and the other one cutting at the distal end to hematopoietic sensors. So the initial part was design of this CRISPR and the production of CRISPR plasmid. These are the CRISPR plasmids and these CRISPR plasmids should be put into the hematopoietic sensors to create the double strand breaks and create the mutation that we desire. The initial testing needs to be done in vitro. So we develop this tissue culture system starting from human CD34 cells. Human CD34 cells were isolated either from the umbilical cord blood or from peripheral blood during blood donation. We should be, be and uh, uh, CD34 cells could be separated using this max technique, which is magnetic activated cell sorting with an antibody for CD34. So the CD34 cells will then be cultured in vitro and differentiated into erythroid cells. So this is a tissue culture system that we develop to test our genome editing approach. So this is again published in experimental hematology. If someone is interested in finding out the a primary erythroid tissue culture system that we use and that's also published. And we mini minimize or we, we did it in very small scale, even at single cell level using these single cell sorters. So this machine can sort single cell at a time, one cell at a time, and the cells can be cultured in these very small plates so that we will be getting a colony from one single cell. So it will be genetically identical colony. And because of the growth factors that we put, ultimately we should be, we were able to get approximately thousand cells from one cell. And I'll, I'll describe how this was done. So this is the, this is the workflow. So CRISPR target selection and design of guide RNAs. We know that we have designed two guide RNAs to either side. Cloning of these guide RNAs into already available CRISPR plasmid vector that was done by a genome editing section of the, of the lab that we worked. And then we had to co-transfect. That means transfection is putting these plasmid into cells. It is also not easy, right, to the CD34 cells. And then they grow them in the erythroid culture system to find out whether they will actually cause reduction in alpha globin output. So the transfection was the next stage. So we now have CRISPR plasmids ready, right? We now have CRISPR plasmids ready, but we need to put them, we have a tissue culture system. We have a way to isolate CD34 cells, but getting these CRISPR plasmids to the CD34 cells is the next, next difficult task. Normal gene therapy, traditional gene therapy approaches use viral vectors, lentiviruses or adenoviruses or retroviruses. They package these sort of DNA into these viruses and the viruses, virus will infect the prime human cell and insert the desired DNA or plasmid into the cell. The otherwise, we need to use the technique known as electrophoration. 
So that is what we use. This machine is called a nuclear factor. This what this what this does is in this small small container we put the cells maybe in 200 microliters and the machine will along with the CRISPR plasmids and the machine will give a small brief electric current so that the cell membrane becomes permeable to a brief period. So this is known as electrophoration. It's quite toxic to cells. About 20 to 30 percent of cells will be dead at the end of the procedure, but you will have 70 percent viable cells. And in those cells, because of the increased permeability of the cell membrane, the CRISPR plasmid will be inside the cell after the electroporation. So this is the technique that we use. So we put CD34 cells as well as CRISPR plasmids into this container and electrophorate. It's a very brief one, a split of a second, it happens and you take the cells out and then put them back in the culture media. And after a day or two, you can select these cells. The, you can select the cells with the plasmids in using flow cytometry based techniques. Because our plasmid, CRISPR plasmid, has a GFP gene, that is green fluorescent protein, which can be detected by flow cytometry and immunofluorescence. As you can see, our negative control is on the left side. The right side is the positive control, where you can see the immunofluorescence microscope, you see the green fluorescence. And in the facts of flow cytometry, you see about 75% cells are GFP positive. That means the CRISPR plasmids are inside the cells of about 75%. It doesn't work 100%, but in 75% of the cells, the CRISPR plasmids have gone in after electrophoration. So, so that's done, that's done. Now the plasmid is in the, inside the CD34 or hematopoietic stem cell. So now we, we presume that it will produce the guidarinase and CRISCAS9 and that will cut the MCSR2 enhancer that we are interested. The alpha globin enhancer will be removed or mutated using this plasmid. And to find out whether they will produce any change in the alpha and beta globin expression. We need to differentiate this hemato because hematopoietic stem cells will not produce alpha or gamma globin, alpha, beta or gamma globin. They are stem cells and in the stem cells, the expression of these genes are suppressed. So we, we had to differentiate them in vitro in the tissue culture lab into erythroid cells, quite late erythroid cells until they become red. The, until the cell palette becomes red to find out whether the alpha and beta globin expression show the desired changes that we were expecting. So that we did using this tissue culture system that I have shown you. If you can, if you can clearly see that the, the picture A is, the, is to show that how minute these tissue culture plates are, very small tissue culture plates, these are known as Terasaki plates. And towards the end, after about 10 days, if you can see in the, uh, the figure C, the cell palette is betrayed. So that means they have they are hemoglobinized. We start with CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells, and with erythropoietin in the culture medium, they differentiate into quite late erythroid cells. As you can see in the cytospines or the cellular morphology pictures, which are seen in uh, the panel E. Day 7, day 10, by day 14, they have almost differentiated into quite late erythroblast, orthochromic erythroblast with a, with a hemoglobin in the cytoplasm. And similarly, the cell numbers goes up. We need large number of cells for our analysis. Although we start with a single cell, the RNA extraction and gene expression assays, we will require some amount of cells, not just one cell. So for that, we need to in increase the number of cells and by day 14 we were having about 1000 cells from a single cell. So we sort one cell at a time into one of these wells and then after about 10 to 14 days we analyze them to find out whether we have the desired mutation. We know that the CRISPR plasmids are in because we have selected them by GFP 
but we need to know whether the CRISPR plasmids have worked and made the appropriate deletion that we want and whether it is associated with reduction in alpha globin. So we analyze the cells at day 10. So these are the results. I'm not very sure whether you are very familiar with these gel electrophoresis images. I hope so. But what we did was at day 10, we, we took all the cells out and the part we used for DNA extraction and remainder we used for RNA extraction. Using DNA extraction, we developed a PCR-based assay to find out whether the desired mutation of the MCSR2 enhancer has been created. In these gel electrophoresis images, if the cell, so these are, these are from a single cell colony, so that's why they are, they are homogeneous. So starting from single cell, so the, in all the cells, if they have the deletion, they will have it. So if you have a wild type, that means no deletion, it will be a larger applicant. And as you see in the sample number 51, that's probably, that's, that's a non-deleted or wild type applicant. So there's nothing has happened. Although the CRISPR plasmids are in, nothing has happened. Whereas in 52, lane 52, is a short applicant and short uh, in about 250 base pairs shorter than the wild type applicant. And that is a sort of 52 is a positive one. That is a homozygous deletion of the MCSR2 region. Whereas if you have two applicants, both wild type and deleted, that's a heterozygous mutation. So in one chromosome, the CRISPR plasmids have worked and cut the MCSR2 enhancer. In the other, it has not. So we analyze about 50. 47 different single cell colonies and we found that in 28 percent the CRISPR plasmids have worked to make had code caused heterozygous deletion. In 45 percent they have caused homozygous deletion so it's worked fantastically well whereas in 13 percent there was no deletion and in 14 another 14 there were there were different type of Amplicans, which we were not expecting. So they have caused some undesired mutations. But what we have shown here is that even in human CD34 cells, the CRISPR plasmids can work and can produce the mutation that we desire. It's not 100%. So a lot of optimization has to be done, but it's worked. It has worked and it has worked in the way that we want, not 100%. Right. So next is to find out whether this deletion of MCSR2 enhancer is associated with reduction in alpha globin. So that is what ultimately won. Yes, through the RNA extraction and RT-PCR, we demonstrated that when you have no deletion, this is the amount of alpha to beta ratio. When you have a heterozygous deletion, the alpha globin expression is reduced by approximately 40%. When you have the deletion in the homozygous state, and the production of alpha globin, the expression of alpha globin has markedly reduced to about 20% from the normal level. So this proves the principle that if we can mutate the MCSR2 enhancer in human cells, and it will invariably reduce the alpha globin production to a desirable level. Next step was to do the same in the cells of thalassemia patients. So we got down, we, we actually took some cells from a sort of patient samples from Sri Lanka to Oxford and did the same. So did they say exactly the same thing, transfected them with CRISPR plasmid, sort them, differentiated for another 10 days, and then evaluated, total analyzed for DNA as well as RNA after 10 to 14 days. Same sort of mutation profile was seen in 36%, we had heterozygous deletion of the MCSR2 enhancer. In 34%, we had homozygous deletion of MCSR2 enhancer. The next step again was to find out whether it is causing the same desired change in gene expression. That was done using again RNA extraction and qPCR or RT-PCR. And the same results were seen. When we compared with the normal controls, 
in beta thalassemia patients because of their recent excess alpha globin they had four times the normal alpha globin to a normal control so that is what is causing this the whole process of hemolysis in patients with thalassemia when we created the heterozygous deletion of the alpha globin enhancer the excess alpha globin level decreased to about half and when we have it in the homozygous level it almost came to it's sort of a, it probably overshoot and is is even lesser than the normal control so we need to make some titrations but this has shown this is a proof of principle study that in patients with beta thalassemia if we can create a deletion of this mcsr2 enhancer it will drastically reduce the alpha globin excess to levels that is desirable in patients with beta thalassemia so we have done certain further assays to find out this mc sort of a genome editing does not affect the erythroid differentiation and erythroid expansion i'm not going to show those results but what i'm going to do show you one more slide which we did to see whether these cells after genome editing will survive in 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 vivo so we did some transgenic mice sorry mice experiments so what we did was what we did was to select human cd34 cells as i have already shown you and to transfect them with crispr genome edit them and after that to transplant them into immune compromised mice so my studies were done using sort of a, with the help of a specific lab that we were doing my studies so we transplanted these cells human cells into mice so these are not just human cells these are the genome edited human cells this was one of the first experiments in the world that we have shown that the genome edited cells are surviving in mice so the mice were alive so we transplanted them into four mice so mice were looked after by sort of animal animal house people and after 12 weeks so there is the standard time the all these mice were sacrificed and the bone marrows were harvested and we did some flow cytometry assays to see whether these bone marrow cells of these mice whether they were carrying any human cells these were done by staining with a human cd45 antibody and four three out of four mice were actually carrying human cd34 human cells generated from the cd34 cells and we have done further assays to see whether the genome editing is present in these cells and yes so what we have shown here is that the genome edited cells can survive in vivo and should be a feasible option in vivo in humans so now we have come to almost the end of the presentation so during this session i have shown you how thalassemia using thalassemia as an example why the genome editing or genetic based therapies are required because there's no cure for most of the genetic diseases and the current genome gene therapy traditional gene therapy has several limitations so genome editing is probably the way forward so in our small study in our small study we showed that the genome editing of human alpha globin enhancer is technically feasible in hematopoietic stem cells using crispr cas9 using crispr cas9 system and when you do that it down regulates the expression of alpha globin to the levels that are beneficial in patients with beta thalassemia so we saw the beneficial effects that we require and lastly we showed that the genome edited stem cells could maintain stem cell processes so we saw these cells even after 12 weeks and we have done a secondary transplant i'm not going to show those so that have shown that these cells will maintain the stem cell properties and survive long term in vivo in living animals there are major advantages of genome editing over other approaches so as i told you the bone marrow transplantation is available for patients with thalassemia but the problem is there's no uh, lack of donors only about 10 percent will have suitable donors and there is a severe life-threatening graft versus source disease and transplant will get rejected 
None of those obstacles are there when you do genome editing. In genome editing, you do an autologous transplantation. So it's the same self cells which are being transferred back after editing the genome. So there won't be any issues with the donors. So it can be used for anyone because the cells are the donor sort of a recipient, same cells. So there's no graft versus host disease and there's no rejection. So it will eliminate all these complications and the child patients after undergoing genome editing and autologous transplantation will not require immunosuppressive medication because the cells are autologous. However, the story is not that straightforward. Still, we are in the in vitro and early in vivo stages. It has not go in, gone into clinical trials, but CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing using CRISPR-Cas9 has gone into clinical trials. One is for thalassemia, as I have already told you in the Harvard University, they are trying to upregulate the gamma globin as a treatment for beta thalassemia, and that has progressed into clinical trials. Whereas we are trying to downregulate the alpha globin as a treatment, and we have not yet progressed into clinical trials. Anyway, with the CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing, there will be off-target defects. We assume that the genome editing or the double strand breaks happen only at the site that we are interested, but it's not the case. This Cas9 can variably cuts in different places, which are known as off-target defects. So maybe, maybe, maybe mutate uh, important gene. So these off-target genes are still a problem or a challenge. DNA damage might cause some toxicity and cell death. And the delivery of these genome editing tools is also not straightforward. Electrophoration is feasible. All antivirus-based methods are feasible, but they also have some limitations. And when it comes to our approach, we don't need a 100% knockdown of alpha globin. In that case, it will be again detrimental. So we need to achieve a precise balance of alpha to beta globin ratio in patients with thalassemia to be therapeutically useful. Some work is still ongoing. So we have we have an ongoing collaboration with Oxford, and we have we have a newly newly established hematopoietic stem cell laboratory, and we are currently doing some cell culture work. The sort of a, not the single cell um, studies, but in, in, we are trying to establish the tissue culture protocol in, in our lab and we are currently doing CD34 separations and in, in, in our lab we don't do genome editing at the moment but we are doing it in collaboration with Oxford. I think that's all I have to tell and I'm happy to take any questions from the listeners. Thank you very much Professor Sajid Metananda for that excellent talk. And it was a very comprehensive presentation. And also, I'd like to congratulate on the amazing work that you all have been doing. Right now, this session is open for Q&A discussion. Uh, if you have any questions, you can directly ask it by unmuting yourself, or you can send the question via the chat. Yeah, um, Professor Sachit Metananda, thanks very much for that excellent talk. It was very clear and comprehensive. Uh, just uh, one question, like regarding the clinical trials, which you have mentioned um, has not gone into that stage yet. So um, how soon can we expect uh, uh, clinical trials in humans with this uh, treatment method? If you uh, can just give us an idea. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to thalassemia treatment, uh, as I have already mentioned, the upregulation of fetal hemoglobin or gamma globin has been the major, major, uh, major uh, way forward in most of the laboratories, and that they have that has already gone into clinical trials. So what they are trying to do there is to they have identified a specific suppressor of gamma globin. So we know the gamma globin has been active in utero and it becomes suppressed and the beta globin expression increases after birth. And the labs that are working on that line have identified a specific gene which is BCL11A 
as a suppressor of gamma globin and they have identified the enhancer of BCL11A and the mutate. And by mutating the BCL11A, they, they expect the gamma globin production to be upregulated and to produce enough hemoglobin for patients with thalassemia. In fact, that using CRISPR-Cas9 has gone into clinical trials and the trials are underway. Whereas our approach was a bit different to reduce the alpha globin and we are probably the only sort of a group that doing that. So we, because of that, the progress is quite slow. We have a proof of principle, but I am not in a position to tell you exactly when this will go into clinical trials because a lot of clinical grade optimization needs to be done. That probably will require inputs from the so industry. So it's not purely the sort of even the University of Oxford is not in a position to take it to a level of clinical optimization. So you need the specific genome therapy based this uh, industry, pharmaceutical industries to help in this. Those industries, sort of these, these, these people are more based in USA. So the USA collaborations are, are quite far ahead than the UK, UK world. So I'm not in a position to say when exactly the our approach, oh, at, 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 if this will go into clinical trials at all, we are not in a position to tell that. But uh, definitely CRISPR-Cas9 based genetic therapies I are in clinical trials and I'm sure will be will be in a routine use in uh, maybe in five years from now. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. There's another question in the chat box. Uh, shall I ask you, sir? Yes, please. Uh, is Casper Cas9 only capable of creating mutations or is it also capable to form gene of interest in the genome? Yes, it is. It can. It can work either way. If 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 I can go back to my slide, let's me uh, go back to the slide which I will show you. Give me a minute. Uh, I hope you see the see my screen. Do you see the screen? Yes, now we can see. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the CRISPR Cas9 will make a double strand break is commonly repaired by non-homologous enjoining. In that, there will be indels inserted and the gene will be the gene of interest or the genomic location of interest will be mutated. Whereas in the homology directed repair mechanism, which is a less efficient repair mechanism, if you can, if you can introduce CRISPR-Cas9 with the normal gene of interest, for example, if you, if you do it for beta thalassemia, you co-transfect the cells with the, with the DNA of sort of a, uh, sort of a uh, the normal beta globin gene. In that case, it can be used to repair an abnormal mutation or in fact to insert a normal gene. But this, this pathway is quite less sufficient. So people are trying to optimize the efficiency of this pathway, but still still uh, uh, not 100% not efficient, or at least reasonably efficient to use in clinical trials. So can be done both ways. It can mutate a gene as well as to repair, or in fact introduce the normal gene into the specific location that we want. But the creating mutation is the more efficient way and the easy way forward, whereas the other mechanism is still under investigation. Thank you very much, sir. There's another question. Uh, is this method MCSR2 
reduce alpha globin since uh, globin synthesis will it be affecting the total globin synthesis and uh, hence the, what are the methods used to overcome that yeah exactly that's 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 that was the exact problem because we don't want a hundred percent knockdown of alpha globin so mean the titration was the issue so if you if i can show you my slide here so you see when you have a homozygous deletion it has reduced the alpha globin to a levels even lesser than a normal control which we don't need because we need some some amount of alpha globin so we need one to one balance so how to overcome is the question so one way we were thinking and we are working on is so the what the the method that we use is to take the entire mcsr2 segment i hope you see my screen yes we can see yes so the approach that we use is to take the entire segment off so if you have do if you do it in the homozygous state so if you do it in the both the chromosomes then the effect will be sort of more than what we expect the other approach that we are trying is if you can see there are several important transcription factor binding sites within this within this enhancer so we are trying to mutate one by one at a time with one kata binding site and any nfe2 binding site to see which one is producing the desired amount of reduction so that is the way that we are thinking that we should be able to titrate so maybe we are taking a, a bit of a uh, the, the length is too much we will just mutate one transcription factor binding site and find see whether the reduction is is optimal so these are quite sort of time consuming experiments and it's they are underway i hope i have answered your question yes thank you very much sir i myself has a small question sir in the fish in the future do you think we can provide gene therapy even if there is a suitable donor uh, for bone marrow transplantation i mean even if there is a suitable donor uh, for currently currently if you take the bone marrow transplantation for thalassemia even in the best of the centers they recommend bone marrow transplantation as the first line only if you have a matched sibling donor they do the sort of unrelated donor transplants as well but that's the second line so your question is even if you have a best possible donor whether the gene therapy or genome editing will be superior i think yes i think yes because it will invariably remove the need for immune suppression so if you are if you undergo a normal bone marrow transplant you need to take immune suppressive medication and there will be a risk of graft rejection at any all the time and graft versus host disease is has a has a about 10% fatality rate so when you consider those when it comes to thalassemia if the genome meditin is efficient and and sort of a routine practice it will replace bone marrow transplantation for patients with thalassemia right thank you very much sir any other questions from the audience in the absence of any more questions i think we can conclude this session uh, the recorded webinar will be shared in our website humangeneticsociety.lk as well as on our facebook page uh, thank you professor uh, metananda for talking for taking your valuable time to join with us and explaining everything in detail clearly thank you so much also i'd like to thank all the participants who have joined with us today on behalf of human uh, human genetic society thank you it's a pleasure uh, talk to you today thank you very much for inviting thank you thank you so much uh, mitanand thank you so much thank you sir thank you bye